Welcome. My name is David F. Wilson, and you're listening to Dust, David's ultimate stone talk, a podcast that aims to explore all aspects of the stone trade, from its ancient origins to its contemporary use as a medium of cultural and creative expression. My guest today is a well-known member of the Stone Tribe, part of a very exclusive club. He stands shoulder to shoulder with the elite, JFK, FDR, OJ, R2-D2, the special ones. <laughs> you only have to hear their initials and you know who they are and what they stand for. <laughs> to those of us in the stone world, we simply refer to him as JSR. It's my pleasure to be joined today by a real statesman for the art and craft of dry stone walling, John Shaw Remington. <laughs> Based in Port Hope, Canada, he stays barely a stone's throw away from the shore of Lake Ontario. His background is in historic building restoration, which has blossomed into a major interest in dry stone walling. President of dry stone walling across Canada, he's been a real advocate for the craft, helping develop a growing interest in the, in the skill in the country, providing a foundation for many younger wallers to build a career laying one over two, two over one. Author of a blog dedicated to all things stone, he's a man who does his thinking with his hands. In recent years, John has been pushing at the edges of the possibilities offered by the craft. To me, he is one of the most creative practitioners working in the field today, and I'm looking forward to hearing his journey of how he got there. Hi, John. Good to speak Hi. to you. <laughs> that was terrific. Thank you. <laughs> no problem. Who is John. that guy? I got to meet him. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. First of all, Shaw Remington, that's quite a, especially yeah. for a Scotsman to be able to, it's a, it really rolls off the tongue. Is, that, uh, is, is there a long list of Shaw Remingtons or is that a recent development? No, no. It, uh, I, you know, the, the best story I could get from my father about it when I asked him, I asked him several times because I thought he should change his story so I could <laughs> tell a better story, but he never did. He was, uh, as a young man, he was in the RAF. He signed up and his, all his papers went into the, uh, to where they do that kind of stuff, keep a record of who you are and what you're doing, how long you're in the RAF. And uh, a couple of years when he came out, uh, his, his middle name was hyphenated to his, uh, his last name became Shaw Remington and he was just either lazy enough or I think he thought it kind of looked, sounded cool. So he just yeah, left it. It. <laughs> and We are the only Shaw Remingtons because I'm an only son. So uh, right, okay. uh, there are uh, versions of us. I have uh, four children and, uh, but uh, no, no Shaw Remington. Right, okay, good, good. Um... So paint for the listener a little kind of mental image of uh, where you are, your location in the world, you know, uh, the area you live in and just a kind of little bit of background for, for you know, to, so as people can kind of place you in the world. Uh, about Port Hope? Or, yeah, yeah or, about Port Hope and, you know, the sort of area. It's a good question. I'm completely surprised by it. <laughs> um, uh, we live in a really wonderful part of the world and... Uh, Hardly anything really bad is around in terms of danger. There's no alligators. We don't have tornadoes. We don't have, uh, um, yeah, the, we're, we're very blessed. You do get and midges, we, John. Hmm? You do get midges. <laughs> <laughs> oh, they're, they're yeah. And, and the, but the one thing we do pay for it is we have winter and it's, it's a national emergency every, every year in terms of, it, Anywhere else they would say, oh, this is terrible, but we Canadians are just used to it. It's what we expect is some sort of really crummy, crummy winter weather. And, and then it's like you paid for all these other wonderful things that, uh, that are, uh, I associate with Southern Ontario. It always amazes me how the Canadians continue working through, or some of the Canadians continue working through the winter. It's just... I know, I know. And I, I used to do it um, a lot. I mean... As a stone mason, there were many times we had to tarp in and, and uh, all the, the heaters and, and uh, the, the, extra, uh, the extra work and, and struggle to, to lay stone and mix mortar, not have it freeze and, and, and not have yourself freeze while you're, <laughs> you're building. So, uh, and then that continued because I, in the dry stone aspect of it, I, I made... Um, I would, I would make sheds or, 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 or somehow contain myself to be able to work through the winter, or we would work in barns and things if we were, uh, if we were doing workshops. And, and it's, it, 
it was a quite a relief to uh, not continue to do that at the, at the point where I, I stopped. I can imagine. You must get to a certain age that that just, oh, I'll just leave it. <laughs> mm -hmm. Must be an easier way of making a living. Yes, yes. You do it when you're younger and you have to, you know. Yes. But, but as you know, and as you pointed out in some of the other podcasts, it, it, it's the lure of the stone. The stone, you feel like you're learning, you feel like you're close to something that's essential. And so you don't mind the hardships. Yeah, yeah. Uh, so just a couple of a few fun questions. Uh, so if you were able to choose anybody in history to, have, to sort of spend the day with on the opposite side of the wall, who would you choose? I'm going to choose somebody that's alive still. I, I think I would like to talk to Andy Goldsworthy. Well, that would be good. Yeah, that'd be quite good fun. I, a lot of dikers must have uh, worked alongside him as well. So, I've met a few of them, yes. And uh, I, I, you know, of course, his, his film particularly gives you an insight to his, uh, who he is and his thoughts about creativity and and about uh, life and. Uh, He's, he's one who continuously, for me, knocks it out of the park. And I, I want to understand the, uh, the brain and the, the spirit behind that. that yeah, that, that, that's, that's very true. I saw his uh, sort of wavy, you know, walking wall in Storm King. And so yeah. in the first day of my travels. And I could have went yeah. home after that day because it was just, just amazing. Just now that, That's something, isn't it? And it, it, you, you kind of expect, or I did, that, well, I built it up. It's probably not going to be any more good than I, I've seen in these wonderful color coffee table books. But actually, it, it does hit you. There's still so much impact from oh, seeing yeah, it. Absolutely. It, 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 standing it in front of it and walking around it and seeing how, to me, it wasn't actually even really about the wall. It was about how the wall uh, interacted with uh, the, the landscape. I just yeah. thought it was absolutely stunning. Just and it's so, on a different, to totally different level of thinking and uh, yes. sort of understanding and way of responding to right. you know, your environment. And, just amazing. And just to stay on the subject for a minute, it, it, it was art. It is art, but he so placed it within the. Um, the environment and, and what was stunningly a contrast was were these iron uh, I beams, hang, colored I beams hanging it, from chains off in the distance. You could you could actually see his wall sometimes, and off in the distance you'd have this uh, thing that had no relevance to, to the environment, except perhaps to say, I have no relevance. And maybe that's <laughs> all I wanted to say, uh, that that the the industrial age is is sitting there saying, "Look at us! We can we can uh, rape the land, and we can we can uh, extract, and we can uh, you know put people in factories and mines and things." And 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 that is art, yes, maybe. But but to me, Andrew was saying, "Look, there's stones around. There's uh, there's things we can build with that don't need." Uh, we don't need to be so uh, destructive to the world. Mm -hmm. well, the, the other thing I thought that he, he responded in that uh, work very well was the, the history of the site. Because yeah. if, if, you, if you carefully look at that area, there, there was obviously a wall there at some point, which was probably a farm wall or yeah. a boundary wall or something. And it's almost like he's he's picked it up and like just shuggled it around the landscape. It's just yeah, just yeah, brilliant. Really, yeah, brilliant, brilliant. So good choice, good choice. Mm -hmm. um, so as you know, the most members of the Stone Tribe love to kind of retire to the bar at the end of the day. Um, so it's your turn on the jukebox. What do you put in? What, what do you spend your 50 cent on? Um, well, jukeboxes, is, is, they're very rare. But if I found one and if it had unlimited uh, choices to put on, I think I would put on something by Dire Straits or, um, or Mark Knopfler. Um, uh, th those, you know, our listeners would be very, um, probably very familiar with that choice. But I'm listening to a guy right now, Max Richter. And, I've heard uh, of him. I haven't, I haven't listened to him. See, so I, I know I'm really out there. But his, <laughs> it's, it's very um, atmospheric music. I, I, I find it's conducive to working and thinking, and it gets me thinking. I, I, I like music as, you know, just 
to react to it and and feel happy and stuff but I, i'm actually on a, a more of a journey to 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 think about um what's going on in this universe and yeah, i yeah. i i'm a little a little hesitant to uh um to just say that what we see is all there is you know i i, I think there's more and mm. and i like music that says okay let's explore it musically yeah, I listen, especially when I'm out on site, I listen to either music or podcasts all the time. And yeah. in some ways, it's it's slightly the opposite, not to to contemplate. It's almost a shut off part of my brain. I, so as I'm kind of, I'm, I'm just concentrating on the work. I, yes. I find it very kind of good for that. It is a, that's a dilemma, isn't it? And I know uh, even Mark, you know, will listen to music, but he kind of, it's in order to shut off something. And, and yeah, for me, like, I... I can't, I've never been able to hear background music, and which is, uh, it's actually an oxymoron to say that because I can hear it, but I don't want to hear it mm -hmm. because I want to hear it. You know, I, <laughs> I, I want to know what the person's singing. I want to, I want to know why that music is on right then. Mm -hmm. And, and uh, I, I'm not good with background music. It, it annoys me. Yeah, there's, there's certain people can't do it, but yeah, it's it, it's definitely my companion at the wall, I would say. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> and then um, maybe something that sur would surprise our listener about you or a guilty pleasure. Um, <laughs> <laughs> I like um, Baileys in my coffee in the morning. <laughs> I, I have a sprig of Baileys every morning in my coffee. Jane and I remember that fondly, and, we say, and the way the times have been recently, we're thinking maybe we should move to that as a as a tradition. Yeah, yeah. John Make gets away with it. Maybe we can get everybody doing it. Just yeah. yeah. I learned it. I learned it with Eric and his wife uh, Carrie. She, uh, we were in Ireland together, and uh, we were looking at walls. We'd hired some guy to show us the walls of Scotland, and funnily enough. It was a, he was a proper tour guy, but he couldn't believe we wanted to just see the walls of Scotland. <laughs> he was showing us sculptures and he was showing us uh, um, uh, many other sort of very touristy things. And we were focused. And sometimes he'd be showing us something on the right, you know, significant to him and all his tourists wanted to see that. And we're looking out the bus the other way because it's a wonderful wall on the other side yeah, of the road. Yeah. <laughs> so anyways, uh, one of our last days in, 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 um, and then it was in Dublin because we went to Scotland and England and then uh, Ireland. And then in Dublin, uh, we had a coffee and uh, and Carrie had it with uh, with Bailey's in it. And I was hooked. I was like, this <laughs> so that's in the weekly shop then. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Very good. So um, have you always been in Canada or where, where did you grow up? Where's where's the sort of. Uh... Uh, it's a long story. I was I was born in England. Um, my parents moved over to Canada when, when I was four, and I managed to find them. They, they were in Winnipeg. <laughs> <laughs> That's a bad joke. Uh, Woody Allen does it better. He says, my, my parents moved five times when I was growing up, and I always managed to find them. <laughs> um, if, only, if only his private life wasn't so complicated. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> um, so, uh, and then we moved to Detroit, so now I'm about seven years old. I did some formative years, uh, about 10, no, about six years in um, Detroit, became very Americanized. And then my parents, uh, to my chagrin, moved to Canada and I was, you know, really upset about it. I, I had so, to... So what, what year were you in Detroit then? I uh, do the mental arithmetic. No, no, no. I, I, um, we moved from Detroit about 1960. 60, 59. Right, okay. So Detroit would be buzzing then at that time then? Yeah, it was It was still going. Uh, um, <laughs> still, well, it is still going, but uh, <laughs> it's, it's changed immensely, I, I would imagine. Um, my my growing up experience there was wonderful. It was, uh, I had a bike. We lived in the suburbs. Uh, I had great friends. Uh, I liked school. We had a, a creek that ran at the back of our uh, house, uh, at the back of many of the houses on the subdivision, and then out into a field, and then into un, unsubdivided areas. <laughs> so there was a bit of nature there, and and 
I can remember days and days of uh, when the creek froze, I put on my ice skates and skate out of the subdivision into this, uh, this jungle of, of, of wonderful uh, trees and meadows and things and just farmer's fields. I think of the Joni Mitchell song, you know, I, I wish I had a river to skate away on. That, wow. that, that's you, a, you, you've loved that then. I, I learned that literally. <laughs> uh, anyways, my father got a better job in, in Canada. He was a commercial artist um, and um, uh, a um, animator and uh, got hired in Toronto. So we made the big move here and it took me a long time to, to accept it. Uh, I remember being very unhappy for a while, but uh, uh, managed and, and uh, went to junior high school, it's called here and then high school. And, and, but at some point we moved again into the inner part of Toronto. We were just living outside Toronto. And uh, my parents made the big plunge for my father to be not a, uh, not an animator, but a sculptor, mm -hmm. because that's what he really liked to do. And that's what he thought he wanted to do and was, was quite good at it. So they opened an art gallery. My mother ran the art gallery and uh, had local artists, uh, well, Canadian artists. Uh, they were big at promoting some of, uh, some of the artists who really made it big after that. And, and I was, uh, we lived over top of the gallery. Uh, my father uh, would have a show you know, once, once or twice a year of, of his work. And um, so I had to learn a lot about art. I had, to, I had to learn about design. I had to learn about what it is to say something is beautiful. And uh, my father taught me about proportions and about making things and about, uh, I think a lot of, you know, as with all of us, our fathers are big, uh, big influence. <laughs> were, were you a keen student then for your father? Because I must have met my, both, my, both, well, all my children have just like shown no real interest in, in, in the art at all. It's just That's what dad does. <laughs> Isn't it wonderful when um, you do see a father and son team that, that, that work it out? That, I've, I've tried the odd days. Come on, come out and spend some yeah. time with your dad. <laughs> Having yeah. done it once or twice, that's never again. I don't know yeah. whether it's being with me or it's the actual, uh, the physical labor. I don't know. I, I I mostly tried it, and and actually hired Colin, and he worked for me and with me for a, a couple phases. Uh, one one year particularly, he he worked with us for uh, for months, and. He was so good at it. He he had a he had a propensity to to make the right decisions as far as far as structure and and the looks of it. And he had he had a a real um, feeling for it. And um, it always uh, puzzled me that he didn't enjoy it. That that he he just. It, there's that other part of him just hated it, and he just wanted to go home, and he he'd be off smoking a cigarette and. and, and <laughs> Yeah, Colin, you can do this, and and he he said, yeah, but I I don't want to do it, and and I think I think it's difficult to get the really younger the ones involved yeah. in it because they don't they don't really get what um, the rewards are at the end. Yeah. You don't know what the, you know it's it's all kind of living on a day day to day kind of basis. They're not they're not thinking about what they're actually creating for for the long term. Yeah. Like, so certainly a lot of people that I've known that have come to craft have come at a, at a later time, you know. Um, so were you a studious uh, student, no. academic or sporty or, or head no. in the clouds in, in the art world? Pretty uninteresting in the sense that I, I, I didn't get involved in any sports. Probably, again, an influence of my, my parents who were kind of bohemian, if you know what I mean. And they... Um, um, Hippies. Huh? Hippies. Hippies, but pre-hippies, of course. <laughs> I, I think that that was not a term you could use for them. Um, but I remember a cartoon, a New Yorker cartoon, where there were there were two hippies sitting in a in a armchair. Uh, it was well, they were sitting in a, on a sofa, and their son was standing in front of them. Obviously, had presented a thing to them that he wanted to join the Boy Scouts. And, and the, the two, the, the mother and father looked at each other and said, where have we gone wrong? Where have we gone wrong? <laughs> so uh, the, the thought was uh, how it relates is that um, 
at some point I, I did uh, uh, stop being um, a goofball and, and, and started to, to become a very traditional um, uh, churchgoer. And uh, this, was, this was sort of uh, a surprise to my family. And, and I, I became a, uh, a born again Christian which, uh, which changed my life. And I, I, for many years after that, I uh, was thoroughly uh, involved in the, uh, the charismatic movement, which is- well, what, uh, To what age did that uh, happen? Well, we had, uh, 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 I was 20, 20 years old when that happened. And um, a series of uh, just what either seemed coincidences or the universe lining up, and I, I said, you know, this is it. This is pretty solid. I better, I better get my life straight. Was there, was and, there uh, something going on in the background that kind of initiated that, or that, that pushed well, you towards that? I, I think, I think uh, a lot of things, but I would focus on um, the the psychedelic age. That that's, that's. I, I mean, I became, I think, through psychedelics at that time, aware of the mess that was around that and uh, and and I was I was not wise I didn't understand how I could what I could do to fix it what I could do to fix myself I was a mess um, I didn't know about sin then or didn't call it that but I, I recognized I was flawed I also recognized this wonderful need to to be thankful for the beauty for the for the design for the for the universe, it seems so well ordered and running on, uh, running so efficiently and, and not efficiently, but spectacularly abundant, extravagantly. And, and I had this need to be thankful inside to somebody or something. And those two things sort of drove me to look for some truth. So, so, so through a member of the family or through a friend or it was just a, it was walking a, up to some knocking on the church door someplace so no, I was working for um, a advertising company I was one of their artists and um, I was the only artist I shouldn't exaggerate I had two <laughs> bosses <laughs> uh, not the only art I was the only one hired to, to learn the uh, the art of, of uh, commercial art um, and uh, one of the printers and one of the salesmen selling the printing uh, would would appear occasionally to bid on some of the, the jobs and he was an amazingly uh buoyant and happy person and I, I i kind of at one point took him aside and said well what what gives with you and and he gave me the 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 party line and i um i began to search it uh much more thoroughly and and went with him to church and uh, i don't know why i'm telling you all this except no this no I, mean, I think it's it's I think everybody's life journey is totally different, and I think it's 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 great to hear it. It's all background information, you know. Yeah, I, 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 I love it. I love I love hearing people's stories, and I think that's yeah. that's that, so, that's that's what people respond to. So to back up now, so my parents were um, they, my father particularly was kind of disappointed with me. <laughs> and <laughs> but I pushed you. Did, did he get you the, the the end with the commercial art? Did he? The uh, opportunity or. No, he didn't. That was a that was a different. I I, I came in a, a different door, and I'm I'm pleased about that that he didn't have to do that. Though he he I was visiting him one day at he lived on no, he didn't live on he worked on University Avenue in in Toronto, and I I had a little motorbike, and sometimes I would um, poodle into Toronto because I wasn't right in in the center of the city, and and um, we'd go out for lunch. We'd have Chinese food on Dundas Street, and um, came back. And just as I was saying goodbye to him in the hall, uh, one of the producers walked by because they, they did live action stuff too. It was just animation. It was live action. And he said, we need somebody quickly. We have to do a, we have to do a, a movie, uh, a TV commercial. And we need you. We just need a, a body. And uh, it was all very fast. And, and I'll tell the story even faster. Uh, I, I said, well, uh, sure. And, and he said, what, what, we, what we want you to do is, is we're going to give you a saxophone and we're going to put you in silhouette so you, there's no detail of the body it's just black on white and we want you to move as if you're playing the saxophone while the uh while the jingle is on it was a beer commercial and this was 
it, this was to be played over top of football games so, or hockey games so that you didn't actually have a commercial, but you're, you know, you're hitting the crowd yeah, with, yeah, the, yeah. with the goods. And, and they said, we actually not gonna film it today. We're gonna film it tomorrow. So, um, so get ready. But how do you get ready for that? So I came the next day, did a series of three commercials. That was a guitar, saxophone, and some other instrument. And I, I did it as if I was playing it. <laughs> and, uh, and so they paid me and it was enough to pay me my actor's fee. Cause I, I, I wasn't an actor. So I had to pay my entire dues to the actors union. <laughs> I ex and I got some money as well, but the, the funny part about it was that the residuals came in for years afterwards because every time they played it, there was, you know, some money to be made. Not, a nice not, gig. <laughs> yeah. And so I, I'm, so now I'm at home and I'm kind of unbearable. I am a, a teenage uh, kid, which is already unbearable. And <laughs> second of all, I have money, you know, and, 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 and so um, they said, why don't you go see your, uh, why don't you go see your family in England? <laughs> Why don't you visit? This was 61, I think, or 62. And I go, yeah, that's a good, no, I didn't. I did, I was, I was sort of, as, as much as I was, thought I was uh, uh, up for stuff like that, it seemed very foreign to me. And, and uh, I was a little bit suspicious, you know. <laughs> they starting. They can't get rid of me. But it turned out to be the best thing in the world. When I uh, stepped off the plane, and uh, now I'm telling the story, you have to fill in the lines. They loved me a lot, and they knew yeah. this was what I needed. And they lined up a, a friend of theirs to pick me up at the airport and show me some of London and and get me um, get me a because the whole idea was that I would be I would live there for for uh, a good amount of time, come back when I wanted, mm -hmm. and uh, and uh, so that was a big gear of growing up. And uh, it was the Beatles, like it was. I was going to say that'd be just just as the Beatles were hitting, that would be an absolutely oh, fantastic oh. time to be uh, in London and in, in the UK. It was it was revolutionary, and and I fell in love with England. I fell in love with walls <laughs> and sheep. And, <laughs> and uh, I like walls. I'm not particularly keen on sheep. <laughs> <laughs> well, just seeing them. Yeah in the fields, you know, and, and castles, of course, and bridges. And I, and I love the smallness of England. Then it's, I don't think it just feels as small anymore. The roads were, well, they are, the roads are small, but the vehicles were small and, and everything seemed the, the right proportion. You know? mm. Anyways, it was a, a, a splendid time to be uh, alive and in London. And I, I worked there for a year at a moving company called Bishop's Move. The, the man's last name was Bishop. He was inevitably he was going to be a chess player or he had to have a moving company, it seemed to me. <laughs> yeah. And uh, you, I don't know if they still operate in, in London, and, but they had depots in, in Bristol and, and up in Edinburgh too and, and places like that. And, and so um, my job was a, a packer. Uh, you would drive and pack beer. You know what? Yeah, uh, yeah, yeah. They, they were called uh, removers, I think, not movers. Yeah, yeah. And, and uh, so I tell this story, except uh, uh, for this reason, that the um, one time we're driving back to London, having done a delivery or, or moved a house, and Stonehenge went by the window. And I, I said, stop the, stop the lorry. I said, stop the lorry. <laughs> and they, they, there were two other people in the truck, and they said, why, what? I said, that was Stonehenge. He says, yeah. And I, you know, I couldn't get used to the idea that, that people walk by this thing you've seen in books and you've read about and you, you studied and uh, in terms of, I, I think even our, in, in our class, we would have slides of cathedrals and things, but you know, there, there was some references to other, um, I don't know if it's art, but it, it, to me, it was pretty moving. And I, yeah. I, I, I convinced them to turn the, the lorry around and we uh and they sat there and waited while and there were no <laughs> they didn't get out <laughs> no they didn't get out <laughs> and, i think uh, you were off the psychedelics by this time <laughs> <laughs> and uh and i just hugged these stones i just that's all i could do i just hugged them and i thought this is crazy good and i tribute probably my, the rest of my stone sojourning to picking up some vibes at that point like i just i just went yeah there there's something here 
And I didn't even need to know what it was. And I think this is, if, if I get anything across to the people asking me what I'm doing when I'm building Follies is, um, I'm building a, a platform for you to imagine your own story here. And, and uh, you, we don't have to know exactly why this was done and because it, it kills the, it, for, for, for some of us, I think, or at least for me, it actually is less interesting than my imagination can, mm -hmm. get, can, can go with. Yeah, I, th I, th I, th I think that's the thing that's difficult to get across to, to, to people who don't work with stone or, or, or have an interest is that just that kind of, that connection that you make with this, this basic material, but you can't really put it into words. And no. I mean, I'm not a particularly spiritual person, but you still get that, that energy. It's, it's that kind of link to, to a time yeah. and space and knowledge that, that you just, we will never know. It's just, yes, yes. You know, there's just I, something very, very special about that. I love it to hear other people try to, put it into words, just what you have. And it, and I have felt it. And, and of course my blog is almost every one is about why do I like working with stone? And then I, I, I uh, dive uh, springboard to, to other uh, aspects of that. And just to finish that other story, um, my, uh, my walk uh, into the um, world of rocks and stones was a kind of, uh, was a kind of sidestep from being kind of disillusioned on my other journey and, and uh, the, 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 some of the final uh, summations for myself was that I hadn't quite got the answer, that there was a lot of truth and a lot of love, a lot of wonderful dynamic uh, uh, qualities that one, is exposed to and as, uh, aspires to and, and even can attain in the in the in the world of uh, Christianity, but for myself, I had to do a back step and I had to go. You know, there's there's a lot that has really troubled me too in my in in my giving all to this this concept that Jesus is everything, and I I became very uh, aware that a lot of people say that and it. It isn't. It isn't true, uh, either for them, or the actual thing they're saying. And so it wasn't and, the uh, full answer for you. It, 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 it wasn't the full answer. It didn't fill no, but, what, yeah, what, what yeah, you were feeling. Yeah, you're not even allowed to think. It, it has to be the total answer, or or you're not a Christian, you know. Yeah, and, yeah. <laughs> and I didn't like that. Um, but I, not that I didn't make it totally for as long as I could. And and so stones, stone. The, the, the substance, the material, and how it is used, and in, in some cases not even used, just sitting there, just a rock in a field, or the Rockies in uh, you know, British Columbia, they're, you've driven through them, they're stunning. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, and so uh, I, I recognize that kind of with stone, you knew where you stood. You, you, knew, you know, if you pick up a stone, you drop it, it, it you know, you have to move your feet, or it'll. It, there's this, there's this um, predictability, in a sense, about stone that that I no longer was able to uh, invest in in people and in particularly in, in their religions. So, uh, so stone became uh, my um, my place of uh, taking a deep breath and and letting the reality and and the the levels of reality um, sort of settle into me. So, so, so th that that you 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 kind of attribute that right back to hugging those stones at Stonehenge, then, I've or was it just? Respect. It it took years for me to have that uh, to to go back far enough, and and because there are other, uh, and you must have had two other um, incidences where stone was around you, you did something or you saw something, but you didn't recognize how it influenced you till much later. And, no, and it kind uh, of seeps into you. Yeah, yeah. And, and so there are these little milestones along the way. Interesting, they're called milestones, but, yeah. um, but that definitely was one of them. Uh, but I, I only I, realized that maybe 10 years into uh, my walling, uh, because I was a, um, 
I was a restoration stonemason, what they call wet mason. I, I don't like that term, but uh, just a, a, a stonemason who did um, structural stuff, not not just. How did it. how did you get into that? You know, so that, was that once you returned back from England? You know, so once you returned back from England, where where did your where did your career grow from there? Um, well, um, I um, we've we've jumped around because. Um, Boy, I don't know where to go. Let me <laughs> let me do a big jump and say I was making guitars at the time for a small company uh, <laughs> based in Uxbridge, Canada, um, and uh, I was kind of not happy because I had a, a boss who was just really you know he he was all over you and 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 any blemish or anything that that he could find he just went nuts about you know and. Uh, he was a, a, a he was an intense guy. So, I, although I liked making guitars, I, I made the necks and, and I used this wonderful uh, tool. A spoke that, shave. Yeah, it just uh, it was so wonderful. And the whole idea was to make this uh, very uh, smooth and, and fine neck. And, and of course, I played guitar, so it was it was it was uh, everybody. Actually, everybody worked in the <laughs> in the shop did have uh, guitars and played them. But anyways, um, because of the intensity of the boss, I, I thought I have to find a different job. And Mary saw in the local paper that there were uh, there was a local builder building the log houses who was hiring a couple uh, laborers, just laborers. And I thought I I want to just do anything. I'll uh, just. Uh, um, and it happened that uh, I began working along with a, another fellow, Peter, uh, for a stonemason who was doing the, the foundation work and the fireplaces for the log houses. And it didn't take long before I realized and he realized that I, you know, there's something about stone and I was getting it. And I was just so loving shaping stones and loving uh, the whole uh, uh, the whole thing of seeing stones fit so that they mm, it was like uh, it was like they were supposed to be that way. So that's how I got into it. So, so you were married by this time, and what what age were you by now? What were you? Uh, I was uh, for, uh, 40? Uh Yeah, 30, 35. I'm bad with numbers. I live in the now. <laughs> it was it was back then. <laughs> so was it just a kind of gradual kind of moving into his space and uh, you know, okay, well, we could be doing with moving on to that. Do you want to have a go at that? Is that where where you started? You know, um, well, we were moving for into this, the stonework. We worked for this builder for as long as we could, and then he kind of went bankrupt. So we took on some of his clients. Uh, the, the stonemason who taught me and, and myself and we worked uh, well together. We, we, we kept doing mostly fireplaces, barn foundations, uh, news, um, churches and, and uh, older brick buildings too. We did a lot of brick restoration. I learned about lime mortars. I learned about all the kind of um, tools that uh, one does for that, for that occupation. But uh, then I bought a farm with my, I was married then, Mary and I, we, we, we bought a farm and I began uh, remembering my trip to England and remembering, not England, because yeah, I did go to Scotland too, so we'll say Britain, <laughs> um, that, uh, that um, I thought, I just, and I looked at the rocks on my property and I, I just started to believe that I could, with with the knowledge I had of stonework uh, in the restoration part of it, that uh, I could employ these stones to, to make a semblance of, of, of a wall. We had Scottish Island cattle and I thought, um, actually Mary said, wouldn't it be nice to see Scottish stone walls in, enclosing our Scottish uh, Highland cattle? And I said, yeah, that's And so I started building walls uh, on my own property and, and I was, I was, you know, I had a lot to learn still. And I, and I, I, I think there's, there's no sense um, I, that I knew exactly what I was doing right away, but I was listening to the stones 
And I was applying all the rules of structure that go with uh, proper stone construction if you're building a stone house, right? And not, not something that's clad with mm -hmm. six inches of stone, but a structural house. And, um, and I, I thought, you know, I should really go back to England and, and get, uh, I get a better, let's see how they're doing it too. And, um, and get some, some advice. So I went, uh, so I talked to Paul Web Weebly. Have you heard of him? No. He, he was the president of the Dry Stone Wall Association of Great Britain. So, so did you know of them before this? I, that this is early days of internet. I wrote to him, he wrote me back and uh, said, come on over and, uh, and uh, we'll, we'll fix you up. We'll, we'll send you around to some of the guys who are building and you can see what's going on. And I had the most wonderful, wonderful trip. And it was Norman Haddo who picked me up at the, <laughs> at the airport in, in Edinburgh. And we just got on so well right away because he was in love with stones and stone walls. And I had become so in love with walling, having not just on my farm, but some other people's places too. And I thought, this is it. This, is, this gets rid of the ingredient that I just did not like, which was the mortar. It was so mm -hmm. controlling. So this cement that had no relationship to the stone at all. It was like, yeah, let's hold the stone like this, you know, <laughs> and uh, I, we don't care if we look ugly and gray. We don't care if we crack and you have to put more stuff in us. We don't <laughs> care if we put the stone in the wrong way. We'll just hold it there for you to hold it the wrong way. And I just hated more for all those things. And I thought, mm. it's gotta be a way to get rid of that. So my slogan and on my t-shirts and on the, uh, I started a website, of course, DSWAC, was walls without mortar because it, it, it rang true that, you know, all you really need are the things that are here again, gravity. What, what's wrong with using gravity, you know? I answered a person on Instagram a little recently, he said, how do you keep it, these, these things together? And I said, there's this wonderful ingredient called gravity. It, it, it's, you know, there seems to be an endless supply of it <laughs> and dependable and it lasts forever, you know, and, and, uh, and I, I think, you know, if you have, you have the stone and you have the time and you have uh, gravity, you just about got everything you need. So was there nobody uh, within Canada in, at that time that you knew that was kind of practicing dry stone walling? That Not that I could find. No. I, I, and I actually set up dry stone walling. Uh, it's called now dry stone walling across Canada. I set it up um, to fish out to find who's doing it uh, in Canada. And I, I did start to discover some people who were dabbling it or, or doing it. Uh, I'm sure there were others who were doing it who didn't contact me. But I began to put a network of people together who could do it, who knew of resources, who had written books, who would teach workshops. I brought Norman over. I, I started bringing people over from uh, um, Scotland and Ireland. And, and it, it was um, this desire just to share this excitement I had about building with stone and building walls without mortar. So but when you came across to England and Scotland then, um, did you do some practical work? Did you do undertake some workshops there to learn or was it more kind of, talking, discussing, looking, is that, is that the way that you things. kind of picked up the bit of more knowledge? It was all those things. It was mostly um, uh, meeting up with wallers in their area, them showing me their walls, me working with them for a day or two. I worked more with Norman and I came back um, after that too, to work with Norman at um, Balmoral. Um, we got along so well and, and our I like to think our style is similar, and and we we talk for ages about uh, about you know about what we're talking about. Well, why why is this so much fun, and and what are we thinking here about this? And I remember the early days working with him at Balmoral, and and I picked up a stone, and I said, look at look at the shape of this stone, and it was irregular, very irregular, and and I said. Uh, he said, I think, he said, I think, I think that's a problem solver, he said. <laughs> and I said, yeah, I like that, you know, it's a problem solver. And then we're working a little longer because I put it aside. And then he turned to me and he said, 
Do you think it's being negative to think that that's a problem solver? Is that does that mean I'm expecting a problem? <laughs> <laughs> and I love that kind of double thinking, you know. And and, and it's been, so much of um, of my life with with working with Stone is it's a parable. It's a life lessons like that. You know, we we get handed a problem solver, but yep. someone phoned in, of course. That's probably what you're phoned in. Stop <laughs> telling. All these stories. You know. <laughs> um, I, yeah, for, funnily enough, I, the way I uh, look at uh, the, the walling, especially, you know, if it's uh, our kind of random material, is that it, 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 the, there's a real democracy in the wall. Everybody mm. has a space, you know, mm -hmm. uh, every stone. Every stone has their own place. No, everybody kind of fits to, to, to be, you know, to, to pull together the whole. Um, so no stone is is discarded. Everybody's brought along for the journey, mm -hmm. you know. Um, so that that's kind of the way I look at it. So it's interesting yeah. to hear your, so your, your it, gets, it gets rid of the expression "good or bad stone," you know, I, and and I, I think again, there's a parable of, well, maybe that that experience isn't a bad one or maybe that guy isn't a bad one or maybe mm -hmm. that decision isn't a bad one or maybe what happened to me here maybe that there's a there's a the good and the bad are uh, not so dualistic yeah yeah there's a redeemable quality in everybody I, so so I, I do think you do kind of relate it back to this the sort of human condition you know it's it's got uh, maybe, maybe it's just too long standing in front of some stone but uh, I don't think, like, the, the, these things and thoughts go through your mind it's uh it's, they do uh, you've got a lot of time and you <laughs> you uh pursue these things as as long as you need to and then make some decision about it um i i i do find them endlessly creative um and it sounds, you know, I, I, when I'm teaching, I say, I don't want to get spooky about this, but the stones do speak to you. And, and, mm -hmm. and it's not, it's not anything verbal, but it pour, it, you, you're absorbing a lot of mass and a lot of things in that mass. And, and um, I think it's conducive to some pretty uh, real uh, summations of, of what life is about. But, but, only certain people are open to that, you, you know. There, there's um, especially with a random material, a, ra a very random uh, um, stone. You know, there um, is no such thing because as that it, it's really difficult. I, you know, I have I haven't done any really workshops, but there are certain times that I'm working away, and you're just responding to the material as you go and trying to kind of impart to a person why you chose that stone over you know the, the thousands of other stones that's lying about it's a difficult thing to to pass across and it's yeah, yeah. purely because i am responding to what's lying there the space that's remaining and what i think will fit there yeah it's, it's a difficult yeah. thing to get across i don't i try not to dwell too much on how difficult it is <laughs> because in, in my case there's something magical that happens and if i if i think too much about how how i do it uh, I probably won't do it as well. <laughs> mm -hmm. um, but I can pass. Um, there was something you were saying. Oh, yeah. Uh, you said random stone. And I've, I've come to the conclusion that there is no such thing as random. I think that's the only thing that, that if you can get your head around it, that everything is part of a pattern. Everything is that. It, it, no, I, I get, I'll go back. I will say that the the strangest thing I think that this universe presents to us is the opportunity uh, of considering randomness that, that I don't, I don't, it must be, randomness is a miracle. It really is that because everything is so, so tied in and so connected, you know, um, that to be, to be saying, oh, that's just a coincidence or that's just random or this pile of stone, um, it just happens to be here. It happens to be there for a reason. And so every stone, so then you, you know, even if you put the stone in wrong, there's a, uh, there's an acknowledging of, you put stones in that are wrong. And luckily if they're not mortared, you go, yeah, yeah, I got to take that apart and put it in the right way. And, and so that's, that wasn't even random. There was a lesson there and you're, you're kind of humble. You're kind of, the stones are always humbling you. So you, you 
I'm sorry to leave you. <laughs> no, no. So we, I, we, I, we're I, I we're just, we're talking and you're left out there. <laughs> so we're so, you know, you're um, after you know your experience with Norman. How how did your 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 dry wall, the dry stone walling, uh, progress from there? What, did did, well, did I, you start getting a kind of reputation, a local reputation for? That's the guy that plays about with stone. Um. There's so many ways to go with this, Dave. How long do we have? <laughs> Just as, as long as you want. As long I, I'm here for it. I'm. I'll probably outlast. You're here all day. <laughs> <laughs> it, it's tremendously clear, and the technology is amazing. I, I'm. I'm going to take a deep breath and and tell myself or, or fool myself that you're actually in the room here with me because I'm still talking to this little yeah, screen, yeah. and I, I want to just try and picture now that you're. You're sitting on the sofa. I'm going to slow it down a bit. Um, there are two ways things happened after Norman and my my walling trip to my home country. Um, first of all, Norman blew me away with his bridge that he and Dieter from Switzerland had made this dry stone bridge, and uh, we made this pilgrimage to see it. it. It was maybe a couple years old at that point, and it looked like 200 years old, and it was it was just my fairy tale vision of what a, a stone footbridge would look like. And, and I, I, amongst other things that I said, I, I said to Norman, I want to be able to bring you to Canada and, 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 inter and have a bridge like this built somewhere. And, and would, you, would you consider that? And he said, oh, I'd love to, John. I just <laughs> love this wonderful way that he talks. And, and so a year later, uh, I arranged um, to, uh, to have a built, bridge built on a property in Port Hope here. We'd just moved to Port Hope. And uh, there, was a, there was a site that looked like it could work as a, a bridge site. It was a small little stream that went through the back of a large bed and breakfast uh, establishment. It was a big, older um, uh, Victorian house right in the middle of town. It was a, probably one of the big, bigger of the estates while the town was growing. And, um, and so I knocked on the door and I, uh, I, I didn't know the people, but I said, we're really looking to, to build a dry stone bridge somewhere in Canada. And, and uh, I did a fairly long spiel and, and at the end of it said, we've chosen your house, uh, your backyard <laughs> to build this bridge. And all you have to do is uh, supply the stone. And uh, I tell this story so many times, but it was so funny because his answer, I was thinking, are you crazy? <laughs> but he more or less said quite the opposite. He said, am I crazy? He said, and, and so now I didn't know what he was answering. He said, am I an idiot? And, and I thought, well, I still don't know what he's saying. Of course you can, he said. <laughs> <laughs> he said, uh, I'd love a stone bridge on my property. And, and, uh, and, and so I proposed that we ran it as a, a mini festival that we, um, that uh, I had, people come over from the States and from Scotland and England and, and we, we build a bridge on his property with stone. And, and I said, and we, you know, he didn't really worry about the price of it and it wasn't very expensive for him. And he ended up with a, a bridge. And, uh, and what a wonderful event it was. Norman was there in all his glory, charming people, left, right and center, telling stories of Scotland, uh, telling, uh, stories about his walling uh, career and a crew of 10 people um, including myself learned how to build a small six foot dry stone bridge and we had musicians playing while we were building and we had um, some literature available and um, our host made meals for for the crew and and uh, and we uh over the course of Thanksgiving weekend, I think that was 2004, uh, over the course of Thanksgiving weekend in Canada, some people would go, you know, uh, elsewhere. They'd leave Port Hope for the weekend, they'd come back. When they'd left, they, they would walk by this property and look down there, and it was just a creek going through, and then on Monday they'd walk down, and, or Tuesday, and they'd look down, and here was this 2,000-year-old bridge, you know, or, or an older you put that there. yeah and and uh i really like the whole aspect of it um 
introducing a, a faux history is is something that I, I kind of fascinates me. And so, uh, but I thought that was it for the bridges. Um, I, I thought, well, that's good. Uh, I've built one bridge or we've built one bridge in Canada, but it became a stepping stone for uh, many projects and many bridge projects, all of which are great stories. Mm -hmm. That's so one aspect. What, one what did you put the success of, of that down to? Was that because um, good question. something that's... tangible or was it because it, it was something unique? Um, authentic, something that uh, people don't normally see. I, I have this kind of theory that uh, stonework in the UK is a bit kind of almost like taken for granted. It is. Uh, it that, is. That, that we don't really appreciate what it is. So, so maybe getting a, a, you know, doing a bridge wouldn't wouldn't create such a noise uh, back here. Uh, I, I I like to think you're wrong. I, I think if. Um, I, I think if, if I, all I know is if I saw someone building a stone bridge, I was walking by or driving by, if someone was building and gonna put, you know, eight, 10 tons across a creek without any mortar, without any I-beams, I would stop and watch and I'd be fascinated. And I'd, I'd wanna say, you know, I need to learn about this crazy craft. And, um, and I would think that still must be the case in Britain. But I do agree that you, you've got, so, they're so ubiquitous and they're so, I think in many cases associated with poverty or with uh, sad times um, because the walls have fallen down. No one's repaired them. A lot of them, right? There's yes, many. yes, yes. Yeah, and, a lot of them are so, in disrepair. And so we don't have that in Canada uh, that I, you know, I'm, I'm I'm talking about a certain aspect of wall. We do have walls that are falling down, but but mostly we have uh, we have uh, the concept of walls are new walls. We don't think of falling down walls. We think oh, a dry uh, a wall that stays and and looks beautiful, and therefore it becomes something that is um, classy or elegant or expensive rather than oh dear, you got a wall that needs repairing. So I think we got a nice head start. In Canada, where wall, uh, walling could be an art, and it could be also something that is associated with people having the money for it, mm -hmm. rather than the farmer who, you know, just wants his walls fixed and and uh, has to do it himself and doesn't really enjoy it. You know, it doesn't yeah, have the same charisma. I mean, that that's a definite kind of. Uh you know, contrast for what the way it is in the UK, you know, yeah. dry stone walling, especially, you know, a couple of decades ago was about just repairing walls. There was grants for it. Um, you know, I, I see kind of Canada and the way that Canada is going as an absolute kind of beacon for uh, the craft. And, it is uh, amazing. Yeah. Mark has pointed out, he says, we've got some of the key, key wallers in, in the world. In, yes, in, I, that's, that's exactly what I would put down. And some of the projects that, that I saw in Canada and that I've seen that, that are planned are, you know, leading the field, really. And, and it, is it timing? Uh, I feel like I was in the right place at the right time just to share my enthusiasm. We had, Mary and I had festivals and we ran workshops and we, around the website and we got as many people who were even a little bit interested we uh we work with that because i responded to anybody who uh even remembered what a dry stone wall was or or, or had lived there or or even somebody who hadn't even seen one but was now fascinated with the concept of building without manufactured products and uh, and i keep harping on that. And I think I may have blown another podcast because I hop, harped on it so much. And I think they were trying to uh, uh, promote the entire industry, the landscape industry. And, and I, I realized that I, I probably am a hard guy to interview on that because I'm, I am a stone enthusiast, but I think we've, 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 as, as, as a, uh, as a, I don't know what I want to say here. I have to be careful. <laughs> Not for um, me. <laughs> Not for me. Um, when, when, uh, when I went to Canada, you know what Canada Blooms is? Do, do you know what I'm talking about? I, I would imagine it's a sort of flower show type. Yeah, yeah. And, and it has had some wonderful uh, days. Uh, 
wonderful years, uh, none of which I was there at, but I, I believe that they were just spectacular. We were invited to, to go and build some walls there and, and show off our, our trade. And I didn't know anything about flowers and neither did the guys I was working with who we were gonna do. So we just put a lot of ferns on everything <laughs> afterward, which I think looks perfect, <laughs> but, uh, good enough. Uh, but I've, I've, since, I've since learned a lot about what plants, uh, you know, I, I acquaint themselves better with, with walls and stonework and stuff. But what the point is, I got to see landscaping at its worst. Um, because the frenzy of, of getting uh, your booth ready, not our booth particularly, but mm -hmm. everyone else's, involves so much noise and dust and grinding and sawing and compacting and uh, bobcats and, and machinery and dust and, and noise. And, I, and, and, and then the day it opens, the extractors take out all the dust and the, all the machinery and, and vacuums sweep up and, and the place looks, looks like paradise. And, and music is piped in and uh, women walk around in bathing suits to, to greet you as you walk around. And it, was, it was so unreal and so unfair to, um, to, to suggest to the people coming to see these things that, you know, if we're gonna, if, we, if you want a garden like this, this is what we're gonna have to do. You didn't see the behind things of the, the, the compacting of the soil and the scraping and digging and, and, and it just, and the noise. And then we'll bring a tree in and we'll put it there. And, and, I, and, and we'll glue a wall together for you. And I thought, no, I'm going a different direction. I, I think we need to find the material that's there and, and work less, uh, less like we are in the um, industrial revolution. We're, this is a new revolution. We're, we're on a green revolution and we got to start. I would like to see Canada Blooms be done unplugged where you were not allowed to go in there without anything except a wheelbarrow and a hammer and chisel and, and your, your plants, which hopefully you wouldn't have forced to, to be in bloom, but right. would be the plants that you could likely with some integrity show as, as uh, what you could do in your garden without, you know, without hurting the planet. Companies wouldn't make money then to throw to them, mm -hmm. you know. It's all about money. Yeah, it's all about money. I mean, it's a good, uh, it, it's definitely a good ethos. Um, just rolling up and getting some stone out of the, the land and just uh, seeing what yeah. you can build. I like listening to you. I'm going to interview you in the next podcast. I'll, I'll call you up and you, you tell me. About I think that's what you're secretly waiting for, isn't it? No, no, no. I'll, I'll maybe I'll maybe make that the 50th if I get to the 50. Can be... I be the interviewer? Yeah, yes, of course. I request. Okay. I'm, I'm just going to go back because I was trying to go another route too, because when I came back from having uh, spent time in England um, with Wallers, including Paul Weebly and... Um, Frank's uh, Francis, I can't remember his first name right now. Um, I also went to a symposium in San Francisco, uh, sorry, Santa Fe. And uh, it was the third one that had been started uh, by our friend Thomas Lips. And so that was another part of my journey at the same time was to meet. And, and I, I like this story uh, because I don't know why. Um, <laughs> Uh, so we're all there in the, uh, in, the, in the lobby of the hotel where we're all staying. Thomas has nicely arranged for us to stay. And, and, um, and, and on the schedule is just a meet and greet and wine and gin, gin and tonic and tasty little treats. And we're all walking around. Now, I've worked with and against many stonemasons in my life. And I've... I've, I've uh, avoided many of them because we're all so mean and miserable. And, uh, <laughs> we're, we are cussed, we can be a cussed lot. <laughs> oh, yeah. no, maybe what she says, use lot could be a cussed lot. Yeah. I, me, I'm you don't Mr. do it that way. I'm That's Mr. Wrong. Joyful. <laughs> yeah. So, and here we are, most of us, there, are, there were some architects, there were some sculptors, but mostly I'm milling around with dry stone wallers. And I, couldn't believe how amiable we were. It was, it was just a delight. 
these were not masons. These were not the guys who use saws and mortar and and just are so bitter and and they're not happy with the stones. It, it's like you know, I see the stone. It's the wrong shape. I'll fix it and put it there. You know, it. Waller see a, a stone and go. Yeah, it might actually be the right shape. I don't think I have to do too much. This. And, and and there was this acceptance of one another and, and a mindset. It was more like, you know, it, I think of, of, of the whole category of masonry. Wallers are like the, the golden retrievers of, of, we're just so happy to see another one, you know, and, and or anybody for that matter. And, and we're just so happy to just build walls. We'll, we'll build them for free. We'll go and we'll donate and go to Italy and fix walls or whatever you want us to do. And uh, I like that. That's, that I, seems I think that's a direct result from, from working the material and yeah. knowing what you can produce. It just brings yeah. about an inner, an inner happiness that uh, yeah. is really difficult to, yeah. apart from the smile, to, to get across to people about the, you know, what, what, what yeah. you get from the craft. And good on Thomas right from the beginning, seeing um, that proponent, the dry stone wall component of the bigger picture again, which is, you know, the architecture and the history and the sculpting and uh, lettering and, and there's there's so many other aspects. But he, he saw right from the beginning that this is a really uh, one to explore in his magazine, particularly Stone Nexus. And uh, in future, uh, uh, in future, what he calls symposiums, we call them festivals here and there. This so I went to a few more of those and was just loving it. I, uh, the, the, the one in Santa Fe. What, what what were you building at that point? What did you build I, in Santa uh, Fe? What was the there project? There wasn't much built that time. Actually, it was. Uh, we had some blocks that uh, we. Uh, I'm not very good at describing that because I was more focused on just meeting some of the people and some of the other things we did. Um, it was, uh, that's where I met Bobby Watt and, uh, Richard Rhodes and, and Pat, did I meet Pat? McAfee. Pat? Yeah. And some of the other, there were some real key players there, including, um, um, Scott George from Rochester. Now, you know of him, right? And, and, uh, the Dan Pearl and Brian and those guys. I know guys. Dan Pearl, um, yeah. Scott George, I'm not sure of, yeah. I don't recognize the name. Well, I think. I, I think they're con quite connected, those two, in, in that I'm, I think Scott was probably a big influence on Dan uh, to get into the, the trade, too. Uh, well, these, these people, um, like the event, the symposium and future uh, symposiums, call these people together. And it, there was like energy, as, as I suppose, with any uh, trade or a rock concert or something, you just pick up the energy of all the, the, the people there. But... Um, I don't know what I'm saying, except I, th I think that's I, th I think it's true because even you know by that time uh, I was becoming aware through the internet of of what was what was happening and uh, seeing the symposiums that were being done by the the Stone Foundation and uh, not being able to go. Just you know you, wow. you you had this kind of real desire to to, to go and see be with these people uh, yeah. because you, you kind of knew you were going to have something kind of really in common with them so yeah you know, um, having been to a couple now you know th there's so that was the internet the internet did that I think otherwise you and I and many many other masons would still be doing what we're doing uh, and just think we're probably the only one or two people who think these thoughts and yeah uh, I say I said I said I say that in my report you know the internet changed everything for, for stone yeah, work you know that's true that's right and, and, and it's changing it even now because there's, there's going to be one or two people who think these crazy people, they really do like their stone. I'm going to go check it out a bit more. <laughs> well, uh, you know, Doug Bell. Yeah. Yeah. So it's one of the things he says. He, he went along to a, some kind of conference some, and somebody started talking about stone and stone, what's stone? And, and then, you know, I need to investigate this. And it's kind of part of what I hope to achieve with the, the podcast is, who knows? You got one, it. Other, one other person, two other people, you know, if you get them to kind of go and investigate yeah. it. And um, just, I, I think trying to get across the joy of um, the craft and being involved with it, it's, it's going to pique the interest of some people, you know, that's that's ultimately what I hope to, to, to achieve. We're being very evangelical, you know. <laughs> but it's like you said, so when I traveled about and spoke to so many people, 
the thing that I came away with was every single one of them, to a man and woman, had a smile on their face. Mm -hmm. And I can only put that down to the craft and, and the material, mm -hmm. which, which I think is a wonderful thing. You know, what, what, we all mm -hmm. need a few more smiles at the moment. We do. Um, smiling. Maybe we could, because um, we've we're kind of, one of the things I'm, so you obviously moved on to doing your bridges and um but you've always brought a bit more to it and i think in some ways you've developed that over the last few years is is putting um more art into your craft and that's always kind of been a bit of a a kind of question an open question that um upsets some people uh but inspires others mm -hmm. so how how or it, what was the first project you could say that you really kind of felt that you pushed it just beyond the sort of boundaries of what was traditionally the, the use of the craft? Mm. I don't know. I think it crept in very, very subtly. Was it something uh, within you or was it something you kind of almost wanted to refer, but I think as you get older, you refer back to your childhood, you refer back to your family. Is it something that can almost like a, a nod to your father? Oh, 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 definitely. Um, it, it, it was, again, in retrospect, uh, at, at some point I, I saw I was doing art and in fact doing sculpture, which it just, that did hit me like a rock. <laughs> and I, <laughs> and I, I went, yeah, that's what my dad was, you know, and, and so that was, that was an eye opener. I think that going, to, uh, you've been at Peter's place in yes. California. I think the opportunity that he, he gave me particularly, uh, that he had seen something in what I was doing. I, I had actually met him at Santa Fe too. And, and I sh showed him, <clears throat> well, he was looking through other people's books of their work and they, I didn't have any books or anything, just photos. And he said, I'm, I'm, I've got a property and I want to, to do some stone stuff on it. I, I'll get back to you, he said. <laughs> and uh, actually we spent a whole day, we, we really got along well. And, and, but I, I didn't hear from him for maybe two years and then he phoned me up and said, I want you to come and build, a, build something on my property. And I said, okay, so uh, how do we do that? And what it turned out to be was that um, he flew me in and picked me up and uh, at his place, we stayed at a place in San Francisco and then went up to uh, Guadalajara and he showed me the place he wanted me to build something and uh, said, I, I think I would like it to be uh, a, a, a stagecoach house. And uh, I thought, well, I've never seen many stagecoach houses. I've never seen a stone one. So I'm gonna to have to make something up here, you know. Uh, and he and he knew that we knew that this was going to be kind of a faux thing. It was it was to be, and I think it was right from the beginning. I realized that this is art here now. This is we're we're doing, but maybe it's just still uh, reenactment art. I, 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 I think I was I was hoping you were going to to mention the stagecoach house because. Um, I, th I think it's really interesting how that was like the first project, but mm -hmm. how you then transitioned from there, because in some ways that's almost like, um, it's almost like an, an easy start. It's, it's, it's almost like the obvious start, ah. but, you, but you've moved beyond that. And it's like, um, I, th I, I just think how it's, it's interesting how you've moved from that and worked with Peter on that and, and moved uh, into some of the other sort of uh, works that you've done there. It has evolved and maybe that's the story. Maybe that's right. Um, because not long after that, one of the years uh, I came in with a, a crew, uh, that sounds wrong. I came in and uh, Sean Adcock came in and a couple guys that I work with um, here in Canada. And we did the, um, what we call the pyro mid, uh, which is the triangular. Yes. The two triangular uh, walled. Uh, I, I thought of it to be a, a, an invisible greenhouse in that there's no glass. You, you just... can, can I ask? So, so part of that. So was the process at that point? Was that come and build something, or come and build something that I he that Peter had in mind, 
or no. was it something you'd been dreaming up? I, th I think, I think what what uh, you and Peter um, have achieved, and the way that you've worked together at uh, the Stone Zone is, is is really something very interesting. I mean, it's world you know world leading, really. Wonderful to hear that. <laughs> Wonderful to hear that. No, the story is I do sketches, I do drawings. I, I someone had introduced me to SketchUp, and. Uh, I also was fooling around on the computer and I can, uh, Photoshop was fun. And I, and I just, I, I dreamed and I lived dry stone and what, what, what else can we do? Uh, and I had come up with this drawing of this. I, I imagine it was as if uh, the, most of the building was underground. I think I must've seen like that, you know, the church in, um, on uh, Innismore that, uh, They've uncovered the sand. The sand blew all over it, and then another storm exposed it years later. And I, I saw these gables sticking up out of the ground, suggesting a building below. And and I I did I did that drawing and um, did it, also introducing an arch in the middle, which is always fun. And then I thought about, well, what if we ran the stones ninety degrees to the uh, or forty five. To, to the normal angle, um, all, all pointing into the arch. And it, it just sang, the design just, just looked great. And I, and, but I just stored it in a file and I, I, I thought, would well, that be so fun to do sometime? And, and it was Peter who now said, yeah, I hope you're coming this year. And uh, we've got all the material ready. And this is how the conversation said, so we got all the material ready. And I said, oh, what would you like me to build? And he says, well, I don't know, that, that's, that's your department. And I said, Peter, I, I got a thing that I would really, really, really like to do. And he says, well, good. And he's not even on the internet, so I can't even send him a picture of it, you know? And, and uh, I, I tried to describe it. And he says, yeah, well, that sounds good. And so I think, I think that the first part of it, that first year we went, I don't think he'd even seen a picture of it, or a drawing of it till uh, we got there. And, and, um, the first year, uh, Sean Adcock got on board and, uh, and we, with some of the other Masons who, who go there and are great help to me, uh, we built this thing that just was everything I hoped it would be. Because I had been discussing with people across the planet on the internet, was it possible? Was the thrust of these stones pushing into the opening going to collapse the, the arch. I mean, and after it was built, it was a no brainer. There was, there was no problem at all, but at, actually there were people saying, no, you couldn't, that was wrong. It, would, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't work. And that's- The naysayers. That's, yeah, the naysayers. And that made me want to just do it more. And, and when I talked to Sean, he said, oh yeah, that, we could do that, I think. And he was fascinated because he was just trying to, or, or he was certainly willing to get out of the pragmatic wall and he, he'd like the art, the arty part of it. He, he, he's really good at that. And he's sometimes frustrated because he's just doing farm walls and stuff. So Peter was there, Peter's venue amongst a few other people here in Canada was a place where we could, uh, I sound like an artist now, where we could uh, explore our creative genius. <laughs> as, I say in, as I say in my report, uh, your creative space. Uh, yeah. Yeah. I, th I, th I think, again, um, that confidence that Peter has in yourself and other Masons, the Wallers, uh, I think is a tremendous thing. I think, um, it is, for, it's you know, for, for him to be able to give, give you the opportunity to explore that, yeah. I think is, is, is a wonderful thing. Yeah. Um, and I, I would love something like that, or somebody to pick up something like that yeah. in the UK, You'll because I think it's, it's 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 showing what you can do with it. It's 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 it's, it's allowing guys to explore uh, the possibilities, and I think I think we're in a kind of transition period from the traditional roll off the material into something that could be really really exciting, and I think the what's happening at Stone Zone and the things that you're making and the other uh, stone people are doing there um, is it, it, a great experimental space. Yes, yes. 
And and what you're doing there, and and the, and some of your can we call them patrons, or are they that yet, or are they? I've only got very few patrons. It's, <laughs> it, it, it's a totally different kind of setup here in the UK. It's mostly, uh, it used to be uh, local authorities. They would have some money for environmental improvements. But um, since the recession, that money has totally dried up. And it, um, there is a kind of different way of being, being approached in that um, it, it's being put on as planning conditions to housing developers. This is a kind of way of getting planning gain, is what they say, and uh, that's so. There's a, a kind of roof tax put on to developments, and so so it does actually produce decent budgets. But you're working with developers, and um, yeah. I don't think it's quite as an um, open and as enlightened as no. what uh, the space there's, that you get at, at Peter's place. And there's something to be said to be working for one person, the committee, um, the bureaucracy, the red tape, the the, how much time it takes for a decision to be made about a design or a change of a design is uh, it's not conducive to the creative flow. <laughs> no, but 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 there's there's positives and benefits as well, though, because um, the work that uh, that you've you've all produced at, at the Stone Zone is amazing work. Amazing, it's amazing opportunity to walk around there and see the creativity on show. It's, it's just brilliant. But only a few people get to see that. But the work that I do and others, yes, it's it's similar to me, it. It, it's out in the public. And, you know, a much wider audience gets to see that and benefit from it. And um, it. somehow it's kind of getting those two things coming together. Hold on, Another phone enough. call. Yeah, here we are. Um, you're right. And we have had this discussion. And, and that's a very legitimate thing. And uh, it's one of the things that troubles me. I, I think in Peter's case, it is, he's quite open to the public. There is that, mm -hmm. oh, he's getting more public all the time. Uh, but it is a, in, there is an invited public though. It's, it's a little more specialized. But I do uh, lament this uh, working for one client, a rich client for uh, years and years and stuff that will never be seen uh, by anybody except this, this person's immediate family or friends. And, and it happens throughout history. There are all kinds yeah, of, you know, uh, but it seems to me in, in Canada where I'm still pushing for uh, the re renaissance, the, uh, the resurgence of, of walling, and I don't think it's happened yet, um, even though it's getting better, it, it requires uh, stone work to be in public places, definitely, definitely. Which, which requires, I think, in some ways, exactly what, people like yourself and what I hope to be is some sort of you know people advocating for what it is what it can be you know it's 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 trying to get in front of the movers and the shakers and saying look look what we what we can bring what the material can bring to to a development I think it's a win-win situation but um we're not quite at that um position yet um, the sun is hitting quite nicely. It, it, it actually is a nice segue. One of the things we're building up at the Stone Zone is, a, is called the Temple of Imperfections. And it's a, uh, it's a whimsical, uh, arched, domed, um, multi-material, uh, mostly stone, all stone, but different. There, there are some relief sculptures. There's, uh, there are niches for other stonework to be put in. Uh, there'll be a pebble floor likely and these different uh, different types of stones including uh, using the um, the curb stones from San Francisco the original curb stones granite so anyways um, that is a work in progress right now Mark is working on the temple of imperfections while I'm uh, I usually go this time of year but Sean Adcock and I who are working on it with Mark and uh, Dave Clayman and a few other key people um, it's just a transitional time and, and Mark is, is working on preparing us for the, the dome part of it. But I'm going to just take you around. Okay. And, uh, show you. So Mark, Mark got all excited and, and started doing models. And he's, he's done a, a miniature of what the dome will look like on top of the... Can you see that? Okay. Yes, yeah. It's sort of corbelled roofing. Yeah, corbel dome roof. Uh, so we won't need form. We can we can step over without uh, formers or or support. And these are 
are on top of the six basalt columns and there's arches on three of, it's a hexagon. Yes, I've, I've, uh, I've seen, seen some pictures uh, on the yes. internet, yeah. And, and so the light is hitting very nicely this one, which is my attempt to, to just imagine what kind of dome, whether it should be a tall dome or a, a flatter dome. And, and just probably more me just thinking about the uh, not being there in California. Yeah. So that's fun. That, I like working with stones and, and wooden blocks sometimes. I'll take you inside. Very cool. Can you still see? Yeah. And is this how okay. you think in, in three dimensions and making models? Is I love model making, yes. And um, uh, you, a plaster scene particularly is, is a really uh, good medium to, uh, to envision what it looks like. Of course, plaster scene stays together better than stones because you can stick them together. Um, one other project I'm thinking about is um, is a cocoon shape, which I, I, I want to attempt to do with uh, with natural stone, not shaping them. And what I want to uh, be able to do is is actually bring this. You see this arch shape? Yes. I want to bring that arch shape over, uh, rather than go round and do a, a formal. Um, what we talked about corbling or where the, uh, the, uh, the counter, oh, what's the word? Um, uh, counter lever, um, that you actually build an arch, but you keep ramping it up and then you come up from this side and you build an arch and then you, f you fill in the middle. And this, this is uh, an exciting project that I, th I think is going to be, um, we're probably gonna run this as a festival and have- Do you have a venue for that? No, this is this is going to be our coming out of the pandemic uh, celebration, and in fact, uh, what we're going to do is uh, we're going to build it in. We, we will not leave the the center of it. We will build. We will enclose ourselves in the building, uh, which requires some thinking about in terms of how do we get out afterwards. But there, um, it's it is the breaking out of the cocoon, which will be the symbolic of us getting out of our our cocoons, uh, whether they be for whatever reason, but basically uh, um, a, a celebration of of a, a, a new era. Let's call that's it. that's uh, that's a lovely idea. It's kind of like, uh, do you know Christo? Have you heard of yeah. an artist called Christo? Yeah. It's kind of yeah. like uh, him wrapping the Brandenburg, uh, not the Brandenburg Gate, um, uh, the Reichstag. Yes, he, you know, wrapping it, and then with all that history, and then. Uh, just like a wee package, you know, unveiling yeah. it, and it's something you. It's, it's that's a that's a great idea. Yeah, I um, and it's risky, and and you pr um, I, I recognize that people are going to say, well, you can't do it, or it's never been done. Um, but I think that's and that's Andy Goldsworthy's uh, genius is that uh, he's willing to take the risk, and and some things do fail. When you see the film, what struck me almost foremost was that he showed his failures and, and that it was an integral part of his art to have to risk to get to where he could do it and it didn't fail. But and, because, because he's learning at every point, isn't he? And, and I, I think, and, but the whole, I think creativity, one big element of it is taking the risk. And I, I don't mean to endanger your life, but you <laughs> might, rebuild it and you might have to um you you might have to it might not be exactly what you thought it was going to be and and there are all kinds of aspects of risk but i think if we are so locked into this is what it will be this is the material we order it exactly this way we put it here this is what and um it it destroys a key element to the thing being beautiful which is that you that you explored the spontaneity, the the the, um, the sense of like it's a jazz improvisation. Yeah. That, I, th I, th I think that's a very important part, and especially a very important part about learning the craft. So, 
I come from an arts background, as, as you know, and a major component part of that art training is uh, being allowed a space to play and experiment because you yeah. don't know uh, yeah. what you're going to come up with. And being yeah. allowed that time to play about, fail, learn as you go, uh, th th that's an amazing thing because that's what pushes things forward. And I think that's what Peter is allowing you to do at the Stone Zone. And it's something that cons concerns me regarding the, the teaching and the passing on of the craft is, is not to uh, inhibit that ability to play and to experiment. Yes, then there, uh, and that's why I do kids events too. When some of the festivals now, I, I exclusively work with the kids and we play. We play with potatoes and, and pumpkins and, and small stones and wooden blocks and firewood. And it's, it's always, uh, uh, it's, not, it's not always just this, but it is to introduce the element of play because sometimes uh, when we're all there with our egos and with our way of doing things and we're working alongside somebody else we're not sure of, we put on our best behavior. Well, it's not usually our best behavior, but we certainly try to do, do things tighter and, and, and more spectacular than, than perhaps needs. Maybe we need to just loosen up and, and, and play with our material. With, I'll, with sh I'll show you what I know. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> So that's difficult. That's been one of my concerns is that uh, when we get good at something, we then can't believe that somebody could just come in and and, and break all the rules and, and do things. I mean, there, yeah, there are, you know, they're not rules. They're certainly uh, what, what uh, Norman calls guidelines. And, uh, but we can make it so exclusive. I don't want it to be a boys club, you know, that, that, that where you can't, well, you're not part of us and, and you can't build with us. And, and that sort of thing has to, has to be addressed because it's not just, that's the beauty of dry stone walling is that more than, you know, building skyscrapers, let's say, you can't have amateurs up there at the top of the skyscraper with the i beams, but you can integrate um, enthusiasts into a structure without all this fuss about, oh, it's going to fall down. Yeah. I, again, I think that that's one of the things I would love to do is just to encourage people to explore the material. Yeah. If it falls down, it falls down. You, you know, if you, you know, if you, if you're, if you, if you're trying to learn on the job and you're, you're, uh, you know, paying, getting a, a client to pay an exorbitant price, then that's obviously wrong. But you know, so I can understand why people get upset when they see the craft not being um, done to a high standard when it's a paying job, but. That's not really what I want to encourage. I, I want to encourage people to kind of play about with the material, yeah. see the strength of the material, see the, the beauty in it and the joy that you get out of uh, playing with it. I think it's one of the interesting things from uh, the, the previous uh, podcast with Peter Shaftsma. Didn't, not, not, a, not a trained mason at all, but he just loves the material. He really responds to it in a sort of very similar way. And yeah. um, why not pass that on? I, and, and what a joy when you do pass it on to somebody and they, uh, like I got an email yesterday from somebody who, who read my book and had um, and some other, um, I've been reading my, um, uh, my blog and, and started experimenting and started trying to build his, uh, rebuild a stone wall on his property. And it, it looks really good. And I'm so delighted. And I think, you know, it's the same person who could have gone to Canada Blooms and looked at a looked at a, a booth and said, "Yeah, I want that." And they come in and they do all the stuff, including giving him a, some sort of stone wall. And then all he can say to his friends is, um, "Oh, I hired somebody to do it." This guy can say, "I built my own stone wall," and that's an aspect I want to just jump on too. Um, I think that. Uh, homeowners and people, they're just people, I'm a homeowner, need uh, benefit more by doing it themselves than hiring somebody to do it. And, and uh, I know I'm cutting my own throat because I do, <laughs> do and yours too. Uh, but I think there's that element that people don't realize that stone is still sticking around waiting to be done something with. And, and why always go to a manufactured product or a, a recognized uh, standard way of doing it. Uh, just have fun with stone, and, and you might 
after the third try doing a wall, then say, you know, I don't think I can do this. Then you hire somebody. Yeah, yeah. It, it depends what kind of, uh, you know, result that you're re required yeah. uh, that, that you want. But I think, yeah, making something by yourself uh, and being able to look at it and to, uh, that didn't exist there before, that's, that's a wonderful thing. And uh, you, you get great joy out of it. You do. You, you just shouldn't ask anybody else what they think of it because then they're, <laughs> then they're... just don't put it on <laughs> Facebook. <laughs> well, it's been an absolute pleasure, John, to catch up with you, and I really appreciate your time. Is there anything else you want to kind of um, impart to the, the listener? Well, I want to impart my how impressed I am with you. I, I think you're a, a, a hell of an artist, a hell of a mason including not just dry stone but but all the other stuff that you've done my f my first contact with you long before i don't think i ever thought i would even meet you was seeing the roundabout at the Ed edinburgh airport and i i went this guy this is this puts it in another dimension this is so cool and i um i didn't realize i'd end up meeting you that i'd end up having you visit us at our house be friends with you, do a podcast, and I just want to congratulate you. You're doing oh, great. Oh, thanks. That's, that's very kind of you to say so. <laughs> it's, uh, you know, it's, it's a great thing for me to be able to point to, uh, especially when, um, when when I started doing the, uh, the Edinburgh Airport one, um, it was almost like a trial for me. And I thought, mm. well, why not? And mm. uh, but, but you did have the, the kind of the old... Traditional, so on your on your shoulders, kind of going. That that's not the way it should be done. That's that's wrong. Um, Good on you. Brave. Know, so <laughs> that was so animals, you know. You were risking. So you know to be able to to hear it from people who know their stuff, to to recognise the worth of it, and to to praise me for it is just it's so rewarding. You know, yeah, I really appreciate that. So well, I, I I I hope to look forward to seeing what you're going to produce at uh, Galala and uh, various things. And um, sounds like you've got something really well planned for after the once it's we not, get out of lockdown. Uh, it, it, it's an idea. That's all. It's not <laughs> I'd love to come and uh, help you get, well, get I, locked inside with you. <laughs> I have it on tape now that you will come and help. <laughs> Very good. Well, it's been great to speak to you, um, and we'll probably just sign off. Um, so we'll just say goodbye. Goodbye. To the Bye to your family. Bye to your viewers. <laughs>